So uh, what I want to do here is we're going to, like I said, we're, we're going to use the principles of classical physics to kind of add on to our results from last time. And so specifically, I'm going to kind of draw the model of the Bohr atom here. And we're, we're strictly modeling a neutral hydrogen atom, to be clear. So that neutral hydrogen atom consists of a single proton and a single electron. And Bohr's model assumes a classically like uh, a circular orbit around this at some given velocity, v, and at some given radius, which I'm going to call r0. And so these, hopefully when you see this here, you can real quickly identify, um, hey, we can maybe use the principles of uniform circular motion to begin analyzing it. And, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. So uh, the question that I'm going to ask is two things. Uh, number one, what are the energies, or sorry, what is the, the, I guess, what is the energy of, for example, the ground state of hydrogen? So what is the energy of the electron specifically? And two, at what radius will it orbit in that ground state as well? And, and as I said before, I think like some of the sexiest uh, 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 theories of physics are the ones that you get out way more information than you can ever expect to get. And this is one of them. So um, we're just going to go through and we're going to use, the, the first thing we're going to use is we're going to describe this using the, the principles of uniform classical, uh, sorry, uniform circular motion and classical electromagnetism just to be able to get some starting principle. And then we're going to apply some of those ideas that we came up with last time. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of this screen here too. So like I said, we're, um, we are going to view this as a uniform circular motion type of orbit. And again, this is not actually what we think it does now, but the model is based on this basic assumption. So the first thing we're going to recognize is that for a given radius r naught and for a given velocity v, the centripetal force equals, wait for it, or well, Think about it and, and, and throw it out there. Um, see if you can recall from classical physics what that, what that equation is here. So, as you remember, hopefully, the centripetal force for any sort of circular motion system is written as mv squared over r. And in this case, I'm going to write it r naught. Now, to be entirely clear, this v is not something that we know, and it's not something we will be able to calculate from first principles. What we will be able to calculate, though, is that r, and once we go through this analysis, by finding that value of r, then we can work backwards actually to calculate exactly what speed we can at least imagine that electron is going. So we're going to start with this, and the other thing that we're going to start with is what force is keeping that electron attached to the proton? This guy has a negative charge. That guy has a positive charge. The, yeah, you can say there's a gravitational force, but you'd be a bit daft to say that because the gravitational force is going to be about 10 to the minus 11 times weaker than the electromagnetic force between them. So we're going to view this as the electromagnetic attraction is directly what keeps that electron in orbit. So I'm going to say this, the, the, electro, uh, the electrostatic force F sub E, we can write as, and again, pause this and try to write an expression based on what you know to be true, at least in the classical sense, that you might have learned in like a physics 2 course here. So, the, and this is, by the way, the Coulomb force is what we're talking about. And the Coulomb force, classically, classically or at least classical electromagnetically speaking, is written as Coulomb's constant K times charge 1, charge two, and then it, I'll come back to that, but remember, Q1, which is the charge of the electron, is negative, and the best, the, the best way we can write this is negative E, where E is what we call the fundamental charge. One point, 
one point six times ten to the minus nineteen coulombs. Yeah, okay, one point six oh two times ten to the minus nineteen. Um, I'm psyching myself out here. So in this case, minus one point six oh two times ten to the minus nineteen coulombs. And Q two, which is the charge of the proton, is just plus e. And by the way, the fact that one is negative, one is positive, is exactly what we had hoped for. Otherwise, this would be a quite unsustainable orbit. It would, in fact, be a hyperbolic orbit where it gets thrown out rather than sucked in. So um, from here on out, I'm just going to ignore the negative sign because we know that they will be opposite. So anyway, we can simply write this as k times, and I'm just going to write it like this, e squared over r naught squared. It's, think of it, kqq over r squared is what it is. And then, just because I like, I like seeing it like this, I'm just going to get rid of those absolute values anyway. And then, as you've hopefully done in any sort of a uh, physics 2 type of problem, uh, well, physics 1 problem, and then physics 2, if you know something is in a, um, you know, a, a, what do you call it, um, Stable or a stable orbit is what I mean to say. You can simply set the centripetal force, which generically will always equal that, to the specific force that is actually keeping it in that orbit. So it looks like this. The we'll set the uh, which side do I want to put? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, we'll set the centripetal force equal to the electrostatic force. Or in this case, and by the way, one more thing, just to be entirely clear, this is the mass of the orbiting body, which we do view it as the mass of the electron. It's roughly about, uh, well, it's 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So about 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. And I am confident about that one. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw that down there, that right there. And we get out Me V squared over R naught, equaling this. So some basic rearrangement. I'm going to try to solve this for V here. And then we're going to go a little bit further based on some of the things that we had done last time. So um, in this case here, we're just going to basically rearrange. This R naught is going to cancel one of those factors there. We'll pull the M over to the side. So this will look like V squared equaling Ke squared over me uh, r naught. And now, if we knew what that orbital radius was, then we're done. <laughs> but we don't know what that is. That, that's the whole point of the damn problem. So um, this is this is the equation that we will eventually come back to, though. If you want to, if you want to know exactly what the velocity of that electron is. Uh, and by the way, um, in, our, in our lecture last time, I had, I had said, let's assume a mildly relativistic velocity. So when we're done with this, this lecture, I do encourage you to go back and plug in these numbers once we have derived that Bohr radius to actually figure out what the true velocity of this is. So it's, it's you know, again, it's the, the, the sexiness that you get so much of these results from such little information. So let's take a step back now. And now we're going to have to employ some of the things that we had uh, derived last time by relating the de Broglie wavelength to the Bohr electron orbitals. Oh, and, and <laughs> in processing the, um, the lecture from last time too, I realized I made yet another egregious mistake, and and I think I, I left some kind of silly remarks and some silly um, uh, text remarks in the in the video. But um, I, I'm guar I, I guarantee that I have just insulted and injured uh, Newton in his grave because at one point or another, <laughs> I, I described the angular momentum as the cross product of, by the way, it's a vector. I describe it as a cross product of R slash V. And this is, I'm laughing in the nerdiest sense possible because this is wrong. And, and as you guys know, angular momentum is the cross product of the radius times the momentum. So it was, it was a simple mistake and literally if, if you just replace V with P throughout, you're good. Um, so I meant to say throughout that's what it was. But just to be clear, if, you, if you've already gone through that, you've seen how, how terrible a person I am. Um, anyway, so um, 
And specifically, the, the way that I describe this is, for a certain energy level n, we can describe the angular momentum as L sub n. And then, by, by assuming a solar system model of, of the Bohr, of the hydrogen atom, we had viewed it to be, the, we had incorrectly, but acceptably, <laughs> viewed the electron to orbit in a planar uh, fashion, and so that, at, in, in a circular fashion, so at any point, the momentum is going to be at right angles to the radius, and the angular momentum will point, you know, out of the plane of that orbit. So, the cross product simply just becomes a, mul a, a, a direct multiplication because the sine of that angle is 90 degrees, uh, or the angle is 90 degrees, so the sine of that is 1. And so anyway, uh, you can write L sub n as simply just Rn times P, or, and this is where we're going to use the classical, we actually call the semi-classical approximation, um, which I, I think I was like... Um, mentally scarred by that term. There was a specific section in the textbook that I learned this from that was titled The Semi-Classical Approximation that I must have read 15 times and still had no clue what the hell it meant. Uh, and I still don't. But basically it means we're going to use, we're, we're going to rather inexplicably use the laws of classical physics to describe the, the phenomena of quantum physics is really what it means. So anyway, um, that's, by the way, Griffiths is the text, <laughs> um, which I have a love-hate relationship with it. So anyway, R sub n times mv is what that is. And by, and, and by the way, uh, this is e there, m, m sub e. And now by writing that, hopefully you see where we're going to throw it there. So not only did Bohr identify that there is some angular momentum, L sub n, that equals that, but the more fundamental principle that, that he had all but just kind of guessed at is that the angular momentum is quantized. And specifically for any energy level n, the angular momentum of that energy level is simply n times that funny looking h-bar. And actually, it's easier just to write it here, n h-bar. And now you see where we're going to go with this. We're going to assume energy level n equal 1, which the, the notation here becomes a little bit kind of screwy, but this means the ground state. And so the, the, the one thing that I don't love, the radius which we should, using this notation right as r sub 1, is also, we're calling it r sub 0. So um, this is the, the, the ground state radius. So don't get confused with this, but from here on out, when I write the radius by assuming that ground state, we're going to call it r0 rather confusingly. But we'll just have to accept it because that is how it's, how it's written in almost every source. But so I hope you see where we're going to employ that now. We have one expression that when you solve it for v, which actually let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's let's just solve it for v here. So v sub one, specifically the velocity of the electron at you know what I'll just leave it as v. Uh, the velocity of the electron in that ground state, simply rearranging it, is given by n h bar over, and in this case, I'm going to write it as me r naught, just to kind of keep the ordering the same. And so now at this point, if you square that, we have one expression for the velocity of the electron at that level using what are more or less, you know, essential constants, except for that unknown radius. And we have another expression for that velocity squared using also simple constants of the universe except for that unknown radius. What are we going to do? Doesn't take a, a, a rocket surgeon to figure it out. We're just going to set that equal to that. So at this point here, 
Uh, I, I will kind of translate that over there, and then I'll have to uh, clear the screen again. So I'm just going to set this guy there, N H bar over M E R naught, and all of that squared equal to K E squared over M E R naught. And now, if you are watching this offline, what I encourage you to do is to pause the video and to answer everything that I've just asked. Because you, you do have the, like there's very little left to do here. Um, because every single thing that we know here, oh, and by the way, that should be one. N is one. I'm, I'm gonna leave it in there for generality right now. Um, and, and we can set this equal to other radii as well. So if N equals two, you can calculate R sub two n equals 3, you can calculate r sub 3, and so on. Uh, but what I want for you to do is to, so just pause and, and rearrange this and solve this for our variable r naught, or, or r1. Uh, and and uh, I am going to just pause here as I'm, as I'm doing this to let you do this right now. I don't know how this happened, but the act of giving the lecture has made both of my shoes come untied. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and just solve for that variable r naught. And I, I'm not going to go through the steps, but it's exactly um, what you just said. So R naught equals, uh, and I'm going to make sure I do this correctly, uh, and I'm also going to put the N squared out in front, and that will be helpful later on. So it equals N squared and then H bar squared over ME times E squared. And I'm going to make sure that I didn't screw that up. Uh, uh, actually, can, can I get a confirmation from you? I do know what you said was correct before. Uh, I think you forgot the K in the denominator. <laughs> Thank you. I know I keep you around for something. <laughs> and the cool thing is, at, well, and, and you know what, I should be a little bit more general, because I'm allowing for n to be any integer at this point here, and so, uh, by the way, any integer other than zero or negative numbers, so uh, by the way, do you know what word we use for that, the, the non-negative integers? There, there is a term that we use. That. So any guess what that kind of scripty n is? It stands for the natural numbers. So the, the, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, dot, 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 are what we, get, what we describe as this, the, the set of natural numbers, which we write as that. Whereas, for example, all the integers we write as that, uh, z, the, the set of z. Um, this is basic set theory notation, which I do, I do encourage all of you to go through and at, at least learn the basics of set theory because it just applies for so many fields. Um, and really, to get anywhere in mathematical analysis, you have to understand the basic principles of set theory. So, um, anyway, so this is true for all n greater than, greater than zero. And oddly enough, when we set n equal to one here, we set n equal to zero there. Anyway, um, so this is one of those things that you absolutely should look up these numbers and you absolutely should plug in these um, to find the actual value here. But for n equal one, when you do the calculation, you set these equal to their appropriate values. What you find is that r sub zero is 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. And again, the fact that we can do a simple calculation based on some odd, like, you know, marriage of classical physics and quantum physics and get a predictable number and then find out that you can actually go eight more decimal or like six more decimal points and it's perfectly accurate. Like, it's just outstanding. So what this means is that we now have the Bohr atom and we'll put the ground state here. Uh, let me write it like this. We have some electron that's orbiting a proton, and instead of thinking about this as r naught, what I'm going to think about this as is 2 r naught. And if you double this and then just do some basic rounding, that diameter right there becomes almost precisely, well, it's about 10 times 10 to the minus 11, which is a dumb way of saying 10 to the minus 10. And as, as we mentioned last time, 
what we define as 10 to the minus 10 is exactly an angstrom. So this is almost precisely one angstrom. And I hope you can see that the A is, it's, you can't see that, damn it. Um, I'll write it in big red. So we have just calculated the diameter of a neutral hydrogen atom in the ground state to be one angstrom wide. And again, every experimental uh, result agrees precisely with this. And, and that's why an angstrom is actually a really useful measure. Uh, because when you're talking about the diameters of atoms, really the smallest you can go is an angstrom. And you know, if, if you look at it a little more closely, it's like 1.6 angstroms. But so the angstrom is really the fundamental measure for how big atoms are, and we don't go below one angstrom. So that, that's really why it's such a useful term in particle physics. It, well, in yeah, atomic physics. Uh, one more thing, this whole factor right here, since these are just fundamental constants, let me kind of rearrange that, when you set um, n equal to one, we're gonna apply one by this thing. So here, this is exactly the same as R0, because one times R0 is R0. So now the numbers become a little bit easier to digest. R sub one equals one times R0. R sub two equals four times R0, and so on. So R0 is that thing right there, and so from here on out, I'm gonna avoid using all of those silly constants and just write R0, and then everything else we can write in terms of that. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to retract that statement because the, the, the typical letter that we actually do see, and, and um, we, we, you almost always see this written actually as A0, uh, so I apologize. So I have little A0 and big A with a, a circular hat, uh, which are on the same order, so kind of useful to know.